The undead are as real as you and me. They come to take their former loved ones with them in the grave. And where I'm from, they're called Trigoi. What I'm about to share with you now is the recount of one of the elders in my village. We'll call him James. And this is his story as he has told it to me. I was born and raised in this village. I am 67 now, and I've been working as a carpenter for over 40 years. I also met my wife here, and we got married when we were in our 20s. She passed away two years ago. It hasn't been easy, obviously, as it never is, but it seems to be getting better. However, I think she wasn't done. I think she came back for me. And this is how things happened. On the day of the funeral, we had an open casket. But every one of us noticed something weird going on with my wife. She was 70 when she died. And obviously, as a 70-year-old woman, she had wrinkles. Nevertheless, I loved her, don't get me wrong, but they were there, they were noticeable. But on that day, they were gone. All her wrinkles were gone, and she looked young and fresh, and she looked like she was smiling. Obviously, people people talk, and there's legends, and I knew about the legend of the Strigoi. It's as old as time here. So the old ladies that were attending the funeral started whispering that she was going to come back as a Strigoi. I tried ignoring it as I'm not the type to pick up a fight, and they were just being petty. So I tried not to interfere and just went on with it. When the prayers and the rites were done with, and we lowered the casket and covered the grave, everyone went home. I stayed to say my last goodbye. I told her that she would be missed, and I thanked her for all the beautiful moments that we had together. I reassured her that I was not going to remarry as she was really possessive of me and I've always loved that about her. I kept our wedding ring on my finger. I'm still wearing it today and I reassured her once again that I was hers and hers alone. When I got home that day I felt like I was getting down with a cold. I didn't think it was weird, as I remember I had been really stressed out trying to do the proper work for the funeral. So I decided I would go to sleep early. I think it was around 7 or 8 p.m. I laid down, I closed my eyes. And soon enough, I drifted away. I woke up a few hours later with a terrible headache. And I thought I was just dehydrated, so I went to get some water in the kitchen. I chucked down the first one like there was no tomorrow. And as I was refilling the next one, I heard tapping at my window. I turned around, and there was a silhouette there. But normally I'm not the jumpy type, but this time it took me by surprise. And my first thought was that someone was trying to play a prank on me. I don't know. I turned around, and I thought it was a woman. She had long, flowy hair. She wasn't really tall, 
and she kept tapping and tapping up my window. She didn't try to run away, which I believe it's what someone would have done if it was actually just a joke. I felt like she was trying to get my attention. So I got closer and I looked out. She didn't move. She smiled and I froze. It was my wife. I rubbed my eyes and for a second I thought I was hallucinating. I backed away and I blinked a few times, still looking at the window, but the figure was still there. She started waving at me and I found myself waving back. I could notice another smile from her and then I heard her voice. I missed you. It's cold outside. Please let me in. I want to get in bed with you. I didn't know what to do and I did not know what to believe. Like I said, I am not a jumpy type and I don't get scared easily. I also don't believe in legends and myths and ghosts and other things of that sort, but in that moment, in my head, it was clearly my wife. She came back. I did not manage to understand how that was possible, but I believed her. She signaled for me to go to the front door to open it for her. She disappeared from the window and soon enough I heard the knocks coming from the front door. As I was walking down the hallway, I kept hearing the knocks, but halfway through I stopped. Something felt weird. I stopped and I thought about what I was doing. I had an eerie feeling and I didn't know if I felt safe to open that door. I stood there thinking about my next move for what felt like an eternity. In reality, it couldn't have been more than five minutes or so. And at some point, the knocking stopped and I heard steps running away from my porch. A few moments later, I went to the door and I looked through the peeping hole. There was no one there. I decided to go back to sleep, trying to convince myself that I just imagined everything. The stress and the loss must have been taking a toll on me, I told myself. I've tried taking it easy on myself the next day, trying to rest. I did not want to tell anyone about the incident that happened the night before, afraid that they would say I'm crazy. But that second night, I became very sure that I wasn't crazy, that I wasn't imagining things. I was as lucid as I could be. And soon enough, after nightfall, the same events repeated. She came back to my window, tapped on it, and then knocked on the door. She started pleading with me to let her in, pleading with me to take her back, promising that she wouldn't hurt me, telling me that she misses me, asking me why I was so afraid, asking me if I didn't love her anymore. And that's when the threat started. She started yelling, screaming and crying, accusing me that I didn't love her anymore, that I had another woman and that I broke my promises. I've tried ignoring all this, obviously it didn't work, so I resorted to drinking. 
I must have drunk an entire bottle of vodka that night. And I remember waking up, passed out, on the floor, on the hallway. These events kept happening for a week. And as time went by, I started growing weaker and weaker. I wasn't picking up the phone when people were calling me to ask how I was doing and if I needed anything. And eventually, my brother realized that something was wrong. And he came by to see what I was up to. When he walked in, he found me passed out on the couch with a bottle of alcohol in my hand. He woke me up and asked me what I was doing and what I wasn't, when, why I wasn't picking up the phone, why I wasn't talking to anyone. He kept asking me questions, all kinds of questions that I can't remember. I didn't say anything. I just shook my head and told him everything was fine. He did not believe me, obviously, and kept pushing for answers. Eventually, I gave in, and I told him what has been going on. I told him that I thought I was going crazy, that I kept seeing and hearing my wife every night coming to tap at the windows and to knock at the door, and that I didn't know what to do. I told him I couldn't ignore what was going on and that I was afraid of telling anyone fearing that I would get locked up, that I would end up institutionalized and forced to take medication that I didn't actually need. I didn't feel crazy, I didn't think I was crazy, but I couldn't find a rational explanation for what was going on either. He sighed, he sat down next to me, patted my back, and told me that he believes me that he knows exactly what's going on and that there is a way to find out if it is actually my wife. I looked at him like he was crazy, like he was kidding. I laughed and I drank some more. He slapped the bottle out of my hand and he dragged me with him to the car and drove us to the cemetery. He grabbed two shovels that were resting on the church's wall, passed one to me, and told me to start digging. Are you crazy? I asked him. Do you seriously suggest that we dig up my wife's body? He nodded and started digging. I've tried talking him out of it, God knows I've tried, but I couldn't, and eventually I gave in. Maybe I wasn't crazy. Maybe he had a point. So I started digging, looking around every couple of seconds to see if everyone was watching us. But fortunately, no one was there early in the morning. Some 15 minutes later, we found a coffin and we opened it. And the sight before us still gives me chills to this day. My brother looked at me and grabbed my shoulders. You're not crazy, he said. But if we don't put her out of her, of her misery, you are in some real danger here. I looked at him as I didn't know what he meant by that. What do you mean put her out of her misery? He explained to me that she was now a Strigoi and that we needed to kill her, or else she was going to keep hunting me until eventually I would follow her to the graveyard. I looked at her and I knew that she was dead, but at the same time she wasn't. She was not laying on her back when we opened that casket. She was laying on her side. And she had dirt all over her dress, all over her hands, and in her hair. That was my wife, but it wasn't her anymore. I knew my brother was right. I knew we had to do something. I looked at him, 
and I nodded, with pain in my heart, for the thing that we were going to do next. I apologized to her, and I watched my brother decapitate her with the shovel. Next, he broke the shovel on his knee, and with one of the pieces, he stabbed her heart. We heard a deep sigh of relief coming from the corpse. The head, the head, I don't know what happened, but the mouth opened and her, her eyes opened and they rolled back as she sighed, as she, as she let out that last sigh. It was unbelievable. I'm calling Maggie, my brother said to me. I'm gonna ask her to come pick you up, take you home, and stay with you for a couple of days until you feel better, okay? I nodded. He assured me that my wife was never going to come back for me again, and told me that he was going to take care of the grave. Some ten minutes later, Maggie's car parked in front of the church, and she helped me get in, and took me home, just like my brother had told me. She cooked me some soup and helped me get in bed. She was being so nice to me. She was trying her best to comfort me. And we started talking about my life with my wife, about all the things that we've been, th we've been through. And at some point, I got quiet. I was thinking. I just had a realization, I told her. She looked at me curious. I was staring into the void. And I found myself muttering these words. It's you, I said. She was jealous of you. What? Maggie asked. Not long before she died, she told me. <laughs> She told me that if I ever let another woman close to me, she was gonna come back to haunt me. But that was not possible. It is not possible. What? How can this be? And so she did. Maggie was the one to help me with the funeral, with the preparations, with everything. Damn, she was... She was there for me most of the time. She was there for me when everyone else was too busy. She helped me cook and clean around the house. She helped me shopping and picking everything that I had to for the funeral. I let her too close and my wife knew. She knew that I've let another woman into my life.